Hello, everyone, and welcome to my YouTube channel. It is a tremendous pleasure today to have uh, with me uh, Philip Booth. Philip Booth is Senior Academic Fellow at the Institute of Economic uh, Affairs. He is also the Director at the Vincent Center and Professor of Economics at the University of Buckingham. And uh, he's also Professor of Finance, Public Policy and Ethics at St. Mary's University. How are you, Philip? Very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a tremendous pleasure. Uh, you'll have all of the details about Philip and his work, his books, etc. in the details of the video below. Make sure that you, that you check them out. Uh, Philip, I would like to start with, uh, with a broad view about policy response to crisis in general. We're, and, and we're seeing that as we go from different crises be it COVID-19 or the previous, the financial mm -hmm. crisis, uh, government uh, spending response is much larger. Mm -hmm. Stimulus packages become uh, unquestioned. I have uh, seen two trillion, three trillion dollar mm -hmm. packages in which seems that nobody questions what are they used for and that it's simply a debate about the magnitude of the stimulus mm -hmm. package and uh, the subsequent reaction of the economy. How does the economy come back from those crises? Uh, the, it seems that we're in, a, in an era in which we have gone from believing that the government and central banks have to be the lenders of last resorts to, to of last resort to being lenders of mm -hmm. first resort. Yeah. What is your general view about this and this and this trend? Okay, l let's divide this into three aspects. So, firstly, I, I think there's a if you like, the microeconomic policy response to the crisis, both this one and the financial crisis. Then there is the question of government spending, government debt and taxation, and then there's the monetization of that debt via the central bank uh, creating money. Now, I don't think we should pretend that the uh, microeconomic response to either this crisis or, for that matter, the financial crisis uh, uh, involve particularly easy decisions. And, and um, you know, the nature of a crisis is that they don't happen very often. So you don't have very many comparators to say, well, we did this well uh, last time, so we'll try this, uh, we'll, tr we'll try it again uh, this time and, and, and expect it to work well again. You know, the, the degree of ignorance, especially in relation to the um, COVID pandemic, because of course we have had financial crises quite a lot in the past, but we haven't really had a pandemic hit a developed economy where it's been in a position to suspend economic activity, essentially, to try and fight the disease, um, I, I, probably uh, ever. So, yeah. you know, decisions as to whether we should lock down, not lock down, um, uh, uh, enhance track and trace, which may involve inhibitions on uh, our freedom, vaccination policies, uh, whether we should uh, back one winner, uh, do as the British government has done, uh, try to uh, buy millions of vaccines from all sorts of different sources. These things are genuinely difficult decisions, and I don't think we should blame the government too much uh, if they get them wrong. So uh, let's, uh, let's not be too harsh when we mark the government on, on those issues. There is then the question, though, of, of how we finance these crises. So uh, we came into, as did most uh, European countries, into the financial crisis with rising levels of government borrowing and government debt. After in the UK and the US, I should say, of, of a period of, of paying down uh, government debt. Um, but, um, and uh, we were really quite ill prepared to deal with the problems that the crisis um, uh, uh, threw at us. But even then, I think what is more worrying is that in most countries, Germany is a very good exception, but in most countries, uh, although some efforts were made, there was no success at all in reducing government borrowing or government debt between the end of the financial crisis and when the pandemic struck. And we, we talk about the financial crisis often as if it's a recent event, but no, it started 14 years ago and um, the, the euro crisis was uh, 12 years ago. And of, of course, it's, it's run on and on and on, but we can't have emergency policy with large levels of government borrowing as if the crisis uh, uh, is never ending. So that took us into the pandemic in a very tricky situation with very high levels of government debt to start with. And then you've got aging populations, which is putting huge pressure on government spending, and governments have then responded to the pandemic by increasing government debt further. I, I think this is a real um, 
a, a, a really serious issue. Now, in very many countries, government debt is reaching levels at which it could, over the next generation, lead uh, to the economy being crippled and, and even a you know, breakdown of civil order and, and the government not being able to conduct its proper uh, its um, the functions it has to conduct uh, properly. So you then get this monetization, and again, I think after the financial crisis, it's, it was genuinely. Uh, difficult because we did see broad measures of the money supply falling, even though narrow measures of the money supply were rising. So those monetarists who believed that uh, we should take our indicators from broad measures of the money supply were comfortable with the process of quantitative easing and printing money in order to stop broad money falling and stop really what happened in the Great Depression in the United States happening um, all, all over the world again. So again, I think we can put that in the, the basket of debatable, difficult decisions. Yeah. And of balance, I, I, I don't think the central banks in the central bank in the UK has, has necessarily got that wrong. But then it came to the pandemic and the pandemic is a supply shock. The government has banned people for working, essentially. You don't resolve supply, whereas the financial crisis was a much broader, um, uh, um, had much broader ramifications. You don't solve supply shocks by printing money. And I think that the, we learned that lesson in the 1970s. And I think we are now in danger of creating um, a large bout of inflation, which will be followed by higher interest rates, which will, will cause a great deal of difficulty. Yeah, what, that's a very interesting point because many people uh, basically assume that the response to this crisis has been adequate uh, because of the, the large scale of the stimulus packages implemented. Mm -hmm. But we tend to forget that the, the economic debacle came from the lockdown and the, obviously mm -hmm. because of the virus, uh, because of the lockdown and the reopening in the vaccination is, mm -hmm. the, uh, is the main cause of the recovery. So in the middle, yeah. you mm -hmm. have this monster increase in money supply and mm. monster increase in spending that uh, sort of distorts the whole picture. We see that uh, the United States recovers as it always does rather quickly, uh, mm -hmm. same with China. And in the Eurozone, the argument that we hear quite a bit is, well, the reason why the Eurozone is not recovering as fast is fundamentally because it is not spending as much as the United States. First, mm -hmm. it is empirically incorrect. Second, uh, we tend to forget that. But the problem, look, uh, and I would like to get your opinion about what is after the reopening, because we have right now a certain level of confidence about what is going to be the economic impact of the recovery. But mm -hmm. we see, for example, that despite a, a very rapid improvement in GDP, that job creation and the job recovery is much slower. We have mm -hmm. seen in the United States, for example, GDP expectations go from plus four to plus six and a half percent, yet unemployment remain at six percent. No. Mm -hmm. um, what are, let's say, for the for our for the people that are watching us, what are the consequences that the average citizen should understand uh, that come from these massive levels of uh, stimulus, particularly the monetary one? Because right now the inflationary pressures are coming and, you know, most of them are blamed on supply disruptions, yet it's not necessarily like that, no? Yeah, yeah. okay. So... Um... I think we've, we really have been through this in, in a sense, in a minor way, in the, in the 1970s, where yeah. countries like Germany took rather different decisions from countries like the United Kingdom. So uh, we had, in the early 1970s, a supply shock, uh, a massive increase in the price of oil uh, related, as it happens, to um, an Israeli-Arab war. And the, uh, the, the response to that in the United Kingdom was to try to um, deal with the supply shock by and deal with the unemployment that it created, which would have probably been quite short term unemployment by continually stimulating the economy uh, through monetary means. And that led to high levels of inflation. Um, but of course, in the long term, it didn't cure the unemployment problem as well. So we got both stag we got stagnation, unemployment and inflation. And, and, and then, of course, you have to deal 
and this is what Thatcher had to, uh, this was really her job, you then have to um, deal with the consequences of higher inflation. And that requires at some stage interest rates, not just to rise because inflation has risen, but also to rise somewhat above inflation in order to reduce inflation again. And that in itself tends to cause, at least in the short term, uh, a, a recession. So you end up with this long period of, um, of recession caused by the pandemic, um, a weak recovery, monetary stimulus, inflation. You, res you then at some stage have to respond to that inflation and that means that you, you then raise interest rates and you never really uh, get back onto a, a sensible growth path. And of course, the reason why we have independent central banks um, in most countries is because that process of trying to squeezing inflation out of the system was so, ex so uncomfortable uh, for many countries, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, United States to a more limited extent uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Mm -hmm. And the one of the things that um, uh, we hear is that the response to this crisis has been quite different, that mm, central banks are not going to adjust monetary policy because of, a, uh, of an inflationary pressure or an, or an increase in prices because they perceive that inflation is transitory. We never know what transitory means, do we? No, huh? yeah. Transi mm -hmm. <laughs> Transi everything <laughs> is transitory in government mm -hmm. uh, uh, view. Mm -hmm. But it, one of the things that uh, citizens are at least seem to be uh, very concerned about is that there is this general view that Yes, we will recover, but the all of those uh, all of those secondary effects of policy are affecting the average citizen savers, real wages more significantly than what probably the headlines or the messages of central mm -hmm. banks say. No, so we have this situation in which already in 2018, 2019, we had protests against the rising cost of living when mm -hmm. they were telling us at the same time that there was no inflation. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that ends up uh, turning the consumer to a more prudent, more conservative um, uh, in its in its in his or her decisions, or do you think that there can be some some different approach this time, both mm -hmm. from the monetary uh, monetary institutions and mm -hmm. the fiscal institutions? Okay. Well, first of all, just to say that inflation uh, uh, always looks transitory, or often yeah. looks transitory because not all prices when you have inflation rise at exactly the same rate. So central banks tend to point to particular prices which are rising rapidly and say, ah, well, no, inflation has risen this month, but that's just because of an increase in oil prices and, and a, or an increase in energy prices or milk prices or whatever it might be. But, but um, of course, that's, but that's a reflection, of, um, of, of course, of average prices uh, rising more rapidly, but also very often the process by which inflation manifests itself leads some prices to rise more rapidly than others. And very often uh, that tends to be commodity prices, especially if you have uh, global inflation. That was certainly the case in the 1970s. So, so that is a real danger. And we had that danger. Uh, we certainly fell into that trap in the UK in the 1970s of always looking at inflation uh, as a, a transitory problem. Oh, it, it will go away when the oil prices start to fall again. But actually, it's the monetary stimulus, which is the cause of the oil prices rising, and and uh, and, and uh, you can't uh, get rid of the inflation until you get rid of the monetary stimulus. Now, in terms of um, people protesting and lack of confidence, uh, etc., uh, in um, inflation measures, I don't um, certainly in, in my country. I think inflation measures are pretty pretty robust. Yeah. But what is happening is that across a, a large number of countries is that especially for the younger generation uh, real wages are, are falling because taxes are increasing there's a um, taxes are increasing i should say whilst government services are falling because of the changing demographics within different countries so uh, governments have to raise more taxes in order to provide the same level of services uh, that impacts of course on the working age population more than it impacts on the uh, on others in the population, and then in addition to that, of course, in, in many countries you've had very you've had anti-growth policies, if you like, uh, which have uh, 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 either 
stymied the labour market by making it more difficult for employers to create jobs, or in the case of my country, you know, massively increased regulation. You know, if you think of regulation of the financial financial sector, GDPR, equalities regulation around um, uh, em employment, and a whole range of other things, perhaps most importantly in, in the United Kingdom, land use planning regulation, which, is lead, which has led to huge increases in prices so that um, young people are now not able to buy a house until they're getting to their late um, 30s. So uh, uh, perhaps rather than hidden inflation, I think what we've got is a, a very real problem of the younger generations seeing their real incomes not rise and seeing themselves poorer than their parents. Uh, and once again, of course, you know, this puts uh, pressure on governments and central banks to find some kind of free solution, which doesn't cost anybody anything, such as printing money. But of course, we know that doesn't work. Uh, absolutely, it doesn't. And more importantly... And in particular, I, it makes, uh, particularly, it leads to higher increases in house prices as well, which is... Absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely right, is that the, the idea that uh, the younger generation is going to get more free stuff from printing money is also a double-edged sword because what we get on the other hand is that it's impossible to purchase a house despite extremely low rates. Mm -hmm. You might get a cheap mortgage, but you cannot buy uh, the house because the principal is too large. Yeah. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you have this, this uh, reduction in the ability to achieve a level of savings that uh, mm -hmm. can uh, help you protect your your income when you're mm -hmm. when you're older. No, the the one of the things there is obviously you mentioned one very important factor that it's amazing how uh, how little we talk about it in the in the in the in the media and in the economic debate, which is demographics. Mm -hmm. is that we're seeing that, uh, for example, in the European Union, uh, very soon about 20% of the population will be older than 65 years old. Mm -hmm. The pension systems are very generous and very and something that governments are never going to to touch at least mm -hmm. no um but it becomes almost a transfer of wealth from the 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 people that are paying taxes the productive economy etc to those that have contributed in the past but uh, obviously the, the 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 measure of of payment is is so vast that it's mm -hmm. very difficult to address it's it's a very di difficult uh, position for a government to address a pension reform. Mm -hmm. But when you look at a country like the United Kingdom or, or, or countries in which the demographic situation is sort of becoming at least a challenge, what do you think are the main lessons that governments should learn? Well, there's a, a phrase in economics that bygones are bygones. And, <laughs> and the, the promises that we've made to um, the uh, current and future generations of pensioners and, uh, uh, in terms of pensions, health care, social care and so on uh, have, have now been made. And unless we renege on those promises, uh, um, and, and I think they will have to be adjusted in, in, in some senses, unless we renege on those uh, uh, promises, then the, those those costs will have to be borne by future generations. Uh, there's nothing really that can be done about that. But I, I think you see the problem when, so the, the, there are, um, uh, the, the left in this country will tend to point to the 1960s as the high point, if you like, of, of, of the welfare state. Um, when um, we had you know, quite a, an extensive social insurance scheme, including earnings related employment, uh, um, unemployment insurance and, and so on. Uh, although it has to be said that poverty was, was much greater than it, than it is today, if measured in absolute terms. But um, government spending was actually, and taxation was actually far lower than it is today. Uh, and that really is a manifestation of the fact that you had, a, at that time in the 1960s, a huge working population and a very small retired population, whereas um, the, the dynamics are now uh, beginning to change. So, as I said earlier, no, every country is going to find itself in the uh, position whereby uh, it's having to tax its younger population more and more in order to, um, in, in order simply to stand still and provide the same level of social benefits. Now, our response to that, those of us who believe in free markets, uh, 
one response is to reform pensions and healthcare systems so you get uh, pre-funding and more private provision, but that doesn't unfortunately deal with the, um, the bygones, the promises yeah. that have been made uh, in the past. Um, so then you have to make the best of a bad job, I think, and, and cut other areas of expenditure so that taxes don't rise uh, more, than is more than, are absolute, than is absolutely necessary because that uh, undermines growth. But also the other tool that you have available to try to increase growth in these circumstances is to deregulate the economy. Now, uh, those, uh, that can be applied in different ways in different European countries. The first target in the United Kingdom would be the uh, the housing market and land use planning. The first target in Southern Europe would probably be labor market regulation. So there, there are different things that need to be done in different um, parts of the uh, e EU and, and also the UK. Mm -hmm. There is quite a lot of low hanging fruit around. You know, if you look at labor market participation in Southern Europe, it's still pretty low. And one of the reasons it's low is because of the extent of labor market regulation. So you can expand your tax base and reduce taxes on others by increasing employment by that mechanism. That is uh, one of the key elements. You know, if, you, if you're going to maintain the promises to the elderly, you need to increase the taxable base by bringing more capital, by bringing more investment, mm -hmm. by bringing more jobs, not by doing the opposite. No? Mm -hmm. However, what, uh, what seems to be the, almost a consensus out there is that um, if anything, uh, and I'm not giving my opinion, it's, it's what I hear out there sometimes, is if anything, this pandemic has shown us that deregulating and uh, opening the economy is a bad thing, that what we need is to have, uh, you know, the Argentine are going to ban exports on meat, just, uh, just what, a, what a tremendous idea to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to defend their, their, their country. It, we're looking at more protectionism, and we're looking at more regulation and we're looking at more taxation as somehow the, the solution. What would you tell to those people? Obviously, I disagree with that. But what would you tell those people uh, about that, that fallacy? No? Well, first of all, I would say that the process of globalization, together with, of course, um, other forms of reform in previously poor countries, has brought hundreds of millions of people out of uh, absolute poverty and also improved other social metrics, whether it's um, primary school attendance, literacy, healthcare outcomes and so on. And, and, and the benefits of this are an order of magnitude greater than the problems caused by the pandemic. But then if you look at those countries which have done best, or shall we say, at least been able to cope with the pandemic with the uh, with the least catastrophic um, uh, outcome, it's those countries which are relatively well off. How do you become well off? Well, having a reasonable level of taxes, low level of regulation, uh, good institutions, sound property rights, uh, and of course, participating in the world economy via, um, uh, via free trade and, and so on. So uh, however bad things have been in the United Kingdom, I'd rather have been in the United Kingdom than say in India or many poor African countries. And I would much rather, India became as rich as the United Kingdom, so the next time there's a pandemic, it's able to cope with it as well, rather than the United Kingdom become more like um, India. Now, on the specific issue of globalization, uh, of course, people blame globalization for the rapid spread of the disease. I mean, that's globalization plus technology, uh, in, in a way. We can just travel much faster than we could in the past. Uh, 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 diseases all, always used to spread around the world, but they just it used to do so in slow motion. And we, we, we can't disinvent the technology which led the disease to uh, spread rapidly. But globalization, by and large, I think has been a huge help. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if you un unpick the uh, different countries which have been involved in different ways in the production of any one individual vaccine, in most cases, you will find a huge chain of global collaboration which matches um, easily matches the tale of eye pencil, which uh, people talk about uh, in order to demonstrate the benefits of trade and, and cooperation. But the other thing is that globalization um, helps create diversification. So there were, there were real concerns in uh, my country and probably in other countries as well about shortages of things at the beginning of the pandemic. 
those concerns very rapidly evaporated. Well, there's a shortage of pasta or something like that, it might have been a shortage of rice, but we were able to substitute so many other things for them, for those things, because of globalization. Whereas we found in the 1970s that when um, there was a shock which hit domestic energy industries, say coal production, uh, we actually literally had to switch off the lights for uh, eight hours a day and uh, two days a week uh, to, uh, to, to industry because we had no alternative sources of uh, coal to generate electricity. So I have to say, you know, creating a siege state is a very bad response to um, uh, trying to deal with risk. Absolutely. I heard this uh, in, a, in a political debate in, in one of the southern European countries. We're saying we need to close our borders so we can export more. It's a fantastic idea, this one. Huh? <laughs> but uh, one of the jokes aside, you, you mentioned that the, the, those key elements, I mean, the, the, we, we tend to talk about the negatives, but we forget the positives. We forget that in, in a little bit less than a year, we've had not one, but five different vaccines. And that uh, it, throughout a massive supply shock, like the one that we have lived, uh, virtually no economy has suffered from relevant shortages. And, 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 and we tend to, get, tend to take those for granted, don't don't we? And, and we need yeah. to remind mm -hmm. viewers about that globalization precisely was a reason why we were mm -hmm. able to, to pass such a, such a monumental event so, so, so well, yeah. no? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You mentioned monetization of, of debt. As, uh, as one thing that, that governments and central banks are uh, have become accustomed to. And obviously we have seen, unfortunately, the, the rapid uh, development and the rapid uh, fashion of this concept of modern monetary theory, no? mm -hmm. uh, which I always say is not modern or a theory because it has been implemented numerous times mm -hmm. throughout the centuries. But... Uh, one of the things that I would like you to to touch upon is is what are the limits to that you that you think monetary policy can have in with all the challenges that we have just mentioned demographic uh, globalization etc the idea that one can just print the way out of out of recession and that one thing and 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 uh, added to that question one of the things that I find very disingenuous about MMT is that it money creation is never neutral the first recipient of money is the mm -hmm. biggest uh, is the is the one that that benefits the most uh so it it massively increases the size of government on the way in by mm -hmm. by increasing money supply to finance government spending and further increases the size of government on the way out mm -hmm. by taxing out of the productive economy the so-called excess of money um mm -hmm. what is your general view about the situation and the limits well, I mean, modern monetary theory, it, it really isn't economics, is it? Uh, and and it's, it's a bit, um, it's, a, it's a bit like flat earth theory, really, which, <laughs> you know, uh, not either geography or physics. But if you if, if, if you look at the, the earth from a certain perspective, it does appear to be flat. And if you look at uh, how um, monetary policy works from a certain perspective, you can draw some of the conclusions, I suppose, that modern monetary theorist proponents do. I mean, economics is about human action, as von Mises told us. It's also, uh, as, as Lionel Robbins put it very well, using a traditional English phrase, it's the science of not being able to have your cake and eat it. In other words, it's the science of, of scarcity and modern monetary theory tries really to transcend that and pretend that there is no scarcity, or at least it, then scarcity comes in by the back door and, and then it tries to deal with it through the uh, mechanism of taxation, which I just find uh, totally contrived. What are the limits of, of um, monetary policy? Well, quite, quite simply, the job of the central bank should be to keep the money supply reasonably stable in order to keep the price level reasonably stable. Uh, so a, um, a central bank ought to be able to deal with some kind of shock which leads to a fall in the, um, the money supply by uh, re responding in policy terms, by uh, allowing the money supply to increase. It ought to be able to deal with uh, and, and this is a more difficult area, a shock to money demand. So yeah. let's assume that we all start hoarding loads of cash for some reason. In fact, in the pandemic, we've, we've done the opposite, uh, although we, we have started hoarding money in bank accounts. So let's assume that we're all hoarding money in bank accounts 
and businesses, instead of investing it because of the uncertainty of the pandemic, are also hoarding money in bank accounts. So there's um, a, a very rapid slowdown in velocity. Well, central banks can respond to that by increasing the money supply. That's a slightly more dangerous game because it's very diff it's much more difficult to work out really what's going on. And then if the central bank does increase the money supply and all of a sudden things go back to normal and people start spending the money that they previously held in the bank, you can then get a burst of inflation. But at least that's within the realm of a central bank. Um, what is not within the realm of a central bank is to create real resources. Uh, so that, um, as I said right at, right at the beginning, the pandemic, the reduction in economic activity due to the pandemic is a supply shock. It's not a, it's not a demand sh shock. And you, you can't deal with the problems of a supply shock by printing money. The, 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 the uh, governments around the world have shut down large amounts of, of um, uh, business, large amounts of economic activity. There is bound to be a slowdown in growth. And that should just be accepted as a consequence of those policies, if we support those policies. You can't reverse that by uh, printing some money. The slowdown in growth is going to happen because we're not allowed to work. So the limits of monetary policy are, it really are that it can deal with monetary phenomena and not real phenomena. Mm -hmm. That is a very important lesson because it's, it's far too often that we hear that central banks are, may be able to address climate change and things like this. Uh, well, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't even think of that, uh, but, but yes, of course, our, no, and our own central bank has been given a remit in, in that respect. It's really rather irrelevant. I think it's been told that when it does quantitative easing, it shouldn't buy corporate bonds, which somehow might be related to, um, to, to uh, lead, lead to um, consequences which run against the government's own climate change uh, uh, agenda. But the central bank, the Bank of England, does so little of that in any case. It's probably fairly irrelevant. Yeah. No, absolutely. I I, I, and I I agree with you. I think that also what I find almost almost uh, I would say amusing is that. Uh, on the one hand, you have governments telling central banks that they have to implement quantitative easing with a with a certain uh, green or mm, uh, uh, climate change view, whilst at the same time, the first sectors that get the largest uh, fiscal support are the ones that uh, come from the old economy, because obviously, obviously, they are also the ones that have the largest level of employment today, you know, mm -hmm. um, which which leads to uh, and, and also, also loose monetary policy often leads to speculation on commodities, which can raise oil prices absolutely, and, uh, yeah. and promote uh, speculation, too. Massive creation, exploration. Yeah, absolutely. Massive creation of money. Yeah, that money is always going to try to go to scarce assets. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you go to is copper, oil, etc. As we are seeing right now. No, it's mm -hmm. not. It's not just uh, that surprise. One thing we mentioned before: the role of taxation. No, and and mm -hmm. I think that we in the last three decades we've gone from seeing a view of taxation as a means to uh, support growth to taxation from a purely revenue uh, enhancement type of, uh, of view there's uh, to the point that we see for example in the united states that the government wants to implement a two trillion uh, infrastructure plan mm -hmm. yet uh, in massively increases taxes not because it's going to cover at least even a, a, a small proportion of that two trillion plan, but from a perspective of some kind of justice type of thing. And, and, and it's becoming a, a bigger burden on growth and a bigger burden on mm -hmm. productive economy. Do you see that that chain of why do we get out of crisis with less productivity growth and with mm -hmm. higher level of overcapacity with that uh, change in the view in, in, in how taxation should be in an economy? Yes, I, I do. And I, I think, uh, I, again, comparisons with the 50s, 60s and 70s, at least in the United Kingdom, but I suspect also in the United States, but not, not in Germany, uh, I, I think are, are valid, that we seem, simply seem to have, we, 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 seem, we seem to have lost um, this, economists understanding of 
public finance and taxation, which we rediscovered in, in the early 1980s in the United Kingdom and the United States. And, and if you listen, if you read articles from the 50s, 60s and 70s and listen to politicians' speeches, they're just all over the place, just like Joe Biden um, is, and for that matter, uh, Donald Trump was uh, uh, t today. If you, they, they read like a bad undergraduate economics uh, essay when they're talking about why they're going to tax and what they're going to do with the money and uh, all the rest of it. So, so concepts such as opportunity costs don't seem to come into it at all. Concepts uh, around the efficiency of the uh, tax system and uh, um, whether you should use borrowing for certain things and taxes, uh, uh, how you should evaluate public investments, uh, etc., just seem to have been thrown out of the window. And a whole load of concepts are just mixed together uh, in, in, a, uh, in a totally incoherent policy analysis, really, which sort of incorporates stimulus, dealing with inequality, dealing with green issues, uh, and yet there's no analytical process which is determining whether or not this particular instrument might help you achieve that particular uh, objective. And I, I, th I think in my country that to some extent there's been a failing, there's a failing within the civil service to understand uh, properly what tax policy should be uh, uh, all about as, as well. I think there's a better understanding as it happens within the uh, bureaucracy of the European Commission about these yes. things. Um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to describe in a way because it's just so incoherent. Um, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's not just bad and misguided in one particular way, that, that it, it's just a, a sort of minestrone soup of all sorts of arguments being used in order to justify um, a, a policy when whatever the policy objective is, you know, even if your policy objective is climate change or reducing inequality uh, or, produ or, or having better infrastructure because the infrastructure needs repairing and there'll be a positive rate of return for, from doing that, um, no, there are analytical frameworks which can help us understand how we should respond to those problems, either through taxation, government spending or regulation, uh, but they're just not being used. Uh, yeah. There's a set of slogans which can be attached to almost, randomly to almost any um, policy device that's proposed. That's, that's a very, very good point, because in the, in the economic debate, uh, you, you constantly hear, well, this is Keynesian policy. Well, if Lord Maynard Keynes watched uh, what mm -hmm. we're seeing, what we're doing today, he would be running away, probably, mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, never in his life did he mention uh, financing current spending with, with, uh, with deficits. No? He mentioned Not about... Not a long period, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that uh, the, the, the current politicians tend to forget get the, the most important words in, 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 the, in which are real economic return. No? And real mm -hmm. economic return has gone out of the window, which is what you just said, which yeah. leads to the problem that if you consistently and constantly subsidize low productivity, then you cannot expect high productivity mm -hmm. growth. No, mm -hmm. That's a big problem, I find. I don't know what your opinion is, is that we have seen productivity growth in developed economies uh, literally just mm, stop and become uh, something that is not even in the economic, probably political debate. Um, what do you think is, is, obviously it looks like the outcome of this crisis is not going to help that situation yeah. either. Mm -hmm. What is your view there? Well, there are different views on this and it's not something on which I'm, I'm sufficiently expert to, to say that one thing is, is more right than, than another. But the, the three candidates uh, I think are, one, the step, so, so um, in the UK and the, the, well, not so sure about the US, but certainly in the United Kingdom, the step change in productivity was after the financial crisis. There's no mm -hmm. question of, of, about that. Before that, productivity growth actually had been quite reasonable. So um, I think there are three candidates in the room. Uh, one is that the, uh, the, 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 the aftermath of the financial crisis was just so, so serious in terms of the monetary stimulus which was brought about as a result of the collapse in, in the money supply led to very low interest rates and therefore didn't lead to the, um, uh, didn't lead to the um, retiring of low productivity, low return investments that you normally get in a recession. So low interest rates have, uh, uh, if you like, encouraged low return uh, in investment. 
The second um, potential candidate is, is that partly because of demographics, the, 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 uh, we have very high levels of saving in some parts of the world, and that's actually pushed down real interest rates. And therefore, at the margin, you'd expect that to lower productivity. And then if you add on to that, the huge increase in government spending and taxes, which took place immediately after the financial crisis, and now is very difficult to roll back because of the demographics, we know that there is a strong relationship between productivity and, um, and, and the uh, taxation and, and government spending. Mm -hmm. The third is regulation. And regulation, I mean, there, wasn't, there was a step change in regulation in the financial sector after the financial crisis. There wasn't really a step change in regulation in other sectors, but there just has just been a general adding to the regulatory burden over the last 20 or 30 years. Some of that coming from the European Union, some of it coming uh, being homegrown within individual uh, uh, countries. And you know, when I think about my own uh, daily life in, in, in my work in higher education, quite a lot of it, at least in one of my institutions, is spent uh, or certainly was when I was managing employees, is spent you know, dealing with the bureaucracy that's required, um, partly because bureaucracies within organisations tend to gold plate government regulation, but, um, but ultimately as a result of government regulation of labour markets, GDPR, and uh, all, all the rest of it. Uh, now, likely to be the case that if there's been a, a step change in, in, in productivity, that there are a number of factors uh, at, at work, and perhaps all, all three of those are. Uh, of course, others suggest that there's a, a kind of secular stagnation caused by the fact that there just aren't high productivity innovations happening mm. at, at the moment. That is a, slightly uh, yeah. uh, difficult to accept, to be honest. I, I find that very, very difficult to accept mm -hmm. uh, as well. I think it's actually the opposite. What we're seeing is, is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a global uh, period of innovation that, that is that unprecedented levels and, and mm -hmm. actually that is, uh, uh, that is making the change in the economy to be much better than what we tend to perceive yeah. precisely because of that, no? Mm -hmm. um, it, might be that, it might be that we're not capturing product improvements effectively in price indices. I agree with that. And I think that that is a very important factor, Philip, mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, uh, the way that we measure economic growth, uh, this, this phone mm -hmm. is measured uh, in, in a way in which basically we're measuring the, the components. No? Mm -hmm. Yet the, the level of services and, and, and the, the, the level of added value that I get from that phone relative to the monster things that we had in the, uh, in the late 80s no? mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is enormous. No? And, and that yeah. doesn't mm -hmm. seem to capture uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit of that, of that improvement. And I think that mm -hmm. when, when we hear in the debate that the younger generations are uh, suffering and therefore will live much worse than their parents. A lot of that is missed in the picture, no? Mm -hmm. A lot of that, a lot of that change. What do you think about uh, the concepts about like the circular economy and, and this, this completely uh, radical change as well in the way in which supply and, and demand chains are, are built. Uh, what, do you have any, any particular uh, thought about what that is going to lead to? To be honest, I've not given that any great, uh, any great thought. Yeah. Um, my, my, uh, my general view, and I don't think this applies to the circular economy, is that, rap that um, big innovations and big improvements in productivity arise when you get inventions or innovations that reduce transactions costs. Yeah. So um, uh, this technology that we're using at the moment, for example, has significantly reduced the transactions costs of people being able to um, consume whatever we're providing to them as compared with them all getting on an airplane and flying to somewhere where you could interview me uh, in, in a lecture theater. Um, the uh, uh, um, Amazon has significantly reduced the transactions costs in the field of retail, so you need fewer intermediate chains between producer and, and consumer. Uh, so I, I tend to think that that's where major innovations and improvements in productivity come from. Can't say I'm a great expert on the, on the circular mm -hmm. economy. And in terms of employment, 
the, one of the risks uh, that uh, people perceive is that all this innovation and technology is likely to destroy uh, a large number of jobs uh, around the world. No, mm -hmm. uh, however, what we see, for example, in the most uh, robotized economies and the most uh, technology advanced economies in in, in Asia, etc., mm -hmm. is that not just they have much lower unemployment, but they have much lower unemployment in the least uh, sophisticated jobs. No. Uh, how can we explain to people that technology is not going to destroy their job or at least uh, their job uh, possibilities? Okay. Well, probably the easiest argument for most people, it's, it's, not, it's not the most rigorous argument, is that people have been saying this for 200 years and they've been <laughs> wrong for 200 years. Now, of course, they might be right this time. So it just doesn't follow that just because they've been wrong. But that's, that's probably the easiest way to uh, ex explain um, the problem. But um, I think it, it, it's easy enough to explain to people, well, you know, think of all the things that you would like more of. Um, if, if, your, uh, if your parents are in long-term care, wouldn't they like more attention from their carers? Wouldn't you like better health care and shorter waiting lists? Uh, what about education? Are you happy with your class sizes of 30 or would you prefer them to be um, 20? The, the, number of, um, the number of areas where employment could expand in order to provide better quality services if employment shrank um, in those fields which are taken over by technology is absolutely immense. And nobody is yet at the position where they can say, well, all my wants are um, uh, satiated. And, and, and if you're trying to convince people, you can actually tie this to things that they really care about and sound, particularly on the left, sort of quite cuddly sort of um, uh, subjects. And that's before you even begin to talk about the potential expansion of employment in the leisure sector. So we might, we might all be working less. That's fine if we're earning the same amount of money. Um, but then we've got more leisure time and we'll, we will use that leisure time, not just sitting at home watching YouTube videos necessarily, but actually um, uh, going out, working with a personal trainer, um, playing golf or whatever it might be. And all these things require uh, labor as, as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's fairly easy to explain um, uh, to uh, people. And certainly if you just present them with the historical fact that this this has just never happened. We've simply got richer and being able to work less. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to, to wrap it up, um, what do you think is the most important challenge that uh, economies, developed economies and emerging economies are going to face after the recovery? Oh, without question, um, uh, uh, demography and uh, because most countries are at their taxable capacity and yet they have huge demographic challenges going forwards. Uh, and, and that's going to lead to very, very difficult um, uh, policy decisions. Uh, and as I say, I think, I think in some cases it could lead to the total breakdown of, of civil society. I would add to that climate change. Now, most people on the sort of free market uh, side of the debate don't talk about it very much, but I, I think it is a real threat, um, but also the policies uh, that we might use to deal with that are, are a real threat as well. So rather like dealing with a the pandemic, these are, this is an area where um, the decisions are, are really not very, not very easy to take. Um, hmm. uh, having said that, almost every action that governments do take to try to deal with climate change are actions which achieve their objectives more expensively than is necessary. Yeah. Uh, so again, we could actually cut carbon emissions at much lower cost than we are doing. Oh, certainly. By increasing, uh, you mentioned before, by reducing regulation, improving competition. Yeah. I mean, innovation and and uh, uh, improvement of the of the environment always come hand in hand with more mm -hmm. competition and more technology. And but also uh, eliminating subsidies, which exist in nearly every country on fossil fuels as well. Absolutely, the 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 subsidization of uh, of uh, f uh, not just fossil fuels but also industries that are extremely intensive in the, mm -hmm. in the use of energy and that and that actually maintain a, a level of overcapacity that is not even needed. No, mm -hmm. uh, well. Philip, it's been fantastic. Uh, it's been a great, great, great uh, chat. A very lively discussion and uh, and very interesting comments. Um, Pleasure. Mm -hmm. 
Thank I you. remind everyone that's watching us that you have all the details uh, to follow Philip and his work in the, the description of the video below, and that uh, we will pester you in the future <laughs> to follow up on, on, on some of these uh, very interesting topics because uh, your, your views are, are very, very interesting. Thank you very much for your time and, uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below and keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.